So Warren Davies is also known as the Unbreakable Farmer. He's one of Australia's leading rural mental health speakers and advocates. A farmer, husband, father of five, son, brother, mate, neighbour and everyday bloke, Warren's authentic, inspiring and sometimes confronting presentations and workshops on mental health are focused around communication, community, connection and seeking help. So uh, we might welcome Warren up to the stage and um, he can tell us his story. Whoops. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for sticking around and, and um, having a listen. It's always um, tough being the last speaker on a, on a long day, but hopefully you'll be able to get something out of my presentation, even the ones that um, heard me speak yesterday. Um, so my name is Warren Davies. I'm known as the Unbreakable Farmer. I am a mental health advocate. I'm fortunate enough to get to travel around Australia and share my story in all different um, communities, different sectors of the agricultural industry and um, beyond. So uh, uh, I'm actually fairly privileged to do what I, what I do and, um, and yeah, thanks um, for, uh, Hannah for the invitation to come and speak um, over the last couple of days. Um, a couple of things that I want you to, um, to understand about me, um, to, for, for those that never heard yesterday, uh, is that, um, <clears throat> you know, just because I'm standing up here doesn't mean that I'm not adverse to mental health challenges. Anxiety and depression is something that I deal with on a daily basis and um, it's something that probably drives me to do what I do today is to, to make sure that um, people are armed with um, tools and strategies to be able to navigate their journey as well. Um, and as I said, I've, uh, I struggle with that on a daily basis, but I've now got tools in my toolbox that help me um, deal with that. One of those tools is medication, and I, I don't, I'm never ashamed to tell anyone that. It's only one of my tools, one of many but it's um, a vital tool in my toolbox. Um, and, and another thing I want you to understand, a couple of things to understand is a lot of the stuff that I'll talk about today through my story is not unique, uh, is, is not unique to me. Um, I'm sure everyone in the room is either experienced or um, known someone that's experienced most of the stuff that I talk about. And that um, leads me to the other point is that um, some, a lesson, a great lesson that I've learned through my speaking journey and, and traveling around speaking in all different communities and particularly those communities that have been affected by disaster is it doesn't matter how big or small your challenge is, that's irrelevant, it's how it affects you and that's the, and that's the key trigger for you then to seek help. If it's affecting your wellbeing, Regardless of how big or small that is, you need to reach out and seek help. Um, I share my story, my, my um, lived experience. My lived experience, not your story, it's my story. But as I said, I'm sure you'll resonate with some of the parts of my story. Um, you know, whether it's only a small thing, you, you'll probably resonate with um, a little bit of my story. Some of that can be confronting and I never, never shy away from that. It's really important to understand the warts and all stories around mental health and wellbeing, um, particularly in rural communities, because um, that's where I come from. I come from a rural community and, um, and that mission that I set out on about... Um, on, about seven years ago is um, something that was born out of probably a necessity or for me searching for actually who I was. I lost my farm in the millennial drought and, and struggling with my mental health and also searching for my purpose and identity in the world again, even though, you know, I'm a husband and a, and a, and a father and a son and a brother and all those things. My identity was all tied up with my farm and losing that, I lost my identity and that was um, a big struggle in my life as well. And <laughs> that search ended up leading me into doing a speaker course, which was quite out of character for me because um, public speaking wasn't something that I um, ever liked doing, never liked standing in front of a room of people and sharing my story. And um, so doing this speaker course was something that was gonna be fairly challenging for me. Um, you know, my only foray into public speaking actually was 
being a footy coach, um, an AFL footy coach, or in our local team, um, coaching the seconds. And you know, I I used to love that, and I had a lot of passion for it. And you know, I used to give 120% every week um, into my coaching. Had the best whiteboards, the best magnet magnets on those whiteboards, the best three-quarter time speech. But um, you know, I could jump up and down and be blue in the face at three-quarter time delivering that speech, and then the players would just go out and do exactly what they wanted to do. They never listened to a thing I had to say. So. Um, so this speaker course was going to be fairly challenging for me. And at that speaker course, my mission was born, and that mission is to create awareness and education around mental health and wellbeing, particularly in rural communities, because as I said, that's where I come from. Understand the impacts that mental illness and suicide has in my community and in the communities I get to work in around Australia. And that's massive. That ripple effect is massive in those communities. Um, um, something a lot of those communities don't recover from. Uh, they just learn to live with it. But hopefully, um, by creating some more awareness and education, they've got more tools in their toolbox leading into the future. The second part of my mission is probably the most important, and that's about inspiring, um, um, inspiring conversations. Um, you know, we need to talk about this stuff. It's something that is, even though we've come such a long way in the mental health space, um, you know, there's still some stigma and taboos around talking about mental illness and suicide in our community. Um, just in sometimes the language that we use within that community um, or the way we talk or describe um, mental illness is something that you know, we've still got a lot of work to do in, but inspiring those conversations is really important. And I believe by sharing my own story, then gives other people permission to share their story, um, you know, so they can then start their journey to recovery or, or a better understanding where they're, where they're placed with their mental health. And thirdly, it's about empowering people to seek help. Seek help in a safe environment that's free from stigma and, and by breaking down those barriers, hope, hopefully we can create those communities and make sure that um, people feel more comfortable to stick their hand up and you know, say, listen, I'm struggling here and I need some help. Uh, as I said, I share my story, I'll, um, you know, a bit of my journey, a bit of my farming journey because I was a dairy farmer all my life, basically uh, from the day that I left school at, at 16 um, for the next, you know, long time, too long, my back tells me it's too long, a long time uh, milking dairy cows either as a farm owner, farm worker or a farm manager. Um, and that led me, as I said, to this speaker course and... Um, so I share that bit of my story, I will shortly, but I want to share how I actually become the unbreakable farmer first and, that, and that's kind of, as I said, a, a bit of a, you know, out there, bit left of centre for me as a dairy farmer to become a professional speaker is kind of, you know, poles apart, you know, because I was good at talking to cows but that's about it and um, so doing this speaker course I treated it as a self-development course, it was something that I was just going to do um, to develop you know, a little bit of self-development because I'd been trying to pursue that to try and you know put those pieces back together in my life after losing my farm and trying to find out who I was, what my purpose in life was. So this speaker course was going to help me do that. Um, I'd been talking to a guy who'd been doing self-development courses for a number of years in Melbourne. He's an entrepreneur, an international speaker himself. Um, but I'd never signed up for any of his speaker courses because uh, for any of his self-development courses because most of them entailed at some time or point in that course rappelling off a skyscraper in the middle of Melbourne and I didn't need that much self-development, I can tell you right now. So, But when he approached me and said, look, I've developed a speaker course, I kind of thought about it but then thought, nah, that's not me, it's way outside my comfort zone. Um, but then he said something to me on the phone one day when he was, you know, on the hard sell trying to get me to sign up and he said to me, you've got a story and who are you not to share it? And that kind of really um, intrigued me and that's what inspired me to sign up for the course. So we did that. I fronted up in Melbourne that first day. But to be honest with you, the drive to Melbourne, which is three hours, I pulled over an hour or so into the trip and just thought, no, nah, I'm going to turn around and go home. This is not going to be for me. It's not, you know, it's definitely not my thing. And I thought, I'll turn around, just go home, ring him up and say I couldn't make it. 
But then the other side of my character is very loyal, so I also then thought I can't not turn up because then I'd be letting him down. So I decided to keep driving. By the time I got to Melbourne, I'd come up with three words in my head that I thought I was going to base my story around. Um, what the story that I thought at that stage I was going to share, which never entailed talking about my mental health journey because I didn't have the courage to do that. Um, those three words that I'd actually come up with were resilience, persistence and determination, the three words that actually encapsulated my farming journey, the three words that I think every farmer has and it, it, it's something that I, you know, I know there's a, a couple of farmers in the room today and I always feel like a bit of a tosser actually standing up here and calling myself the unbreakable farmer because I reckon every farmer is unbreakable and generally most farmers have these three words of resilience, persistence and determination built into their life and that's what I was going to share my story around was about my journey and as I said mental health wasn't going to be part of that journey. When I got to Melbourne I fronted up at the, the, the building, went up to the 10th floor and walked into a, for, a foyer with about 20 people milling around and then I spotted the guy that I'd, who was facilitating the program and he was way out there. Like for a dairy farmer, a bloke from the country and this bloke's got a mohawk, he's got a lime green jacket on, yellow shorts and blue runners on, um, got tats on, he's got earrings, he's got you know the bracelets, the whole thing, he's, he's out there for me. But So he's really stood out like dog's balls for me. I could see who he was. So went over and... Um, yeah, introduced myself and he handed me the, the agenda for the day and I had a look at it and all of a sudden I went into cold sweats because I never thought that you would have to talk at a speaker course, you know, definitely not in the first, week, first couple of weeks until you actually knew what you were doing. Um, but I looked at, there at the agenda and it said introductions, Trav was going to introduce the, how the course was going to run and then after the, he'd done that, up until morning tea time, we all had the um, privilege of standing up in front of the room and sharing a seven-minute presentation on our story. Now, yeah, I was crapped myself then. I didn't really know what I was going to say. Didn't know what the, you know, how I was going to structure my talk or whether what I was going to say was going to have any relevance to anyone because, you know, they're all um, from the city, these people. They're all business owners and, you know, I didn't know if that was gonna cut the mustard. I implemented something that I used to implement at school really well. It was a real, it was one of my solid strategies at school is that if you move to the back of the classroom, duck down, don't make eye contact with the teacher or the facilitator, they won't ask you to get up or, and talk. So I did that, went and sat at the back of the room, ducked down in my chair, um, made sure he couldn't see me. And then obviously other part of that strategy is you just tell the person next to you, I can't think about the answer or I don't know what it is. You go up and you, you talk about yourself first because I've got no idea. But obviously 20 people doing the course, your turn comes pretty quickly. And um, mine did. So I stood up in, in front of this, this group of people, didn't know any of them from a bar of soap and, and blurted out seven minutes of I don't know what. Um, I know um, it was my story because that's what I had in my head. But the exercise was made quite difficult. One of the things that put me in a cold sweat was that um, one, you thought the, what you presented had to be a heartfelt story. Now, for me, that was going to be easy. It was going to be my story. Um, but for the other people in the room, it was going to be difficult because most of them, as I said, were business owners. They either, um, you know, owned a business, they'd written a book or they had developed a business model that they were wanting to learn how to articulate better. And there was a number of IT experts and accountants within this group. So I don't know about you, but, you know, to give a heartfelt message around accountancy about figures and spreadsheets, you're going to have to do pretty well um, to be engaging. So that was the first box we had to tick off. The second box that we had to tick off during this seven minute presentation was going to be difficult for everyone. Um, and that was that you had to make someone cry. Now that was going to be definitely difficult for the IT expert. It was going to be even, I think, even more difficult for the accountant. 
Uh, but don't get me wrong, my accountant's made me cry on a number of occasions, but it's not because he was giving me a heartfelt story. It was generally what he was handing across the table to me for me to read. Um, so I got up, said, said my seven minutes of, yeah, as I said, just blurted out anything, and um, I ticked the first box because it come from my heart. It was my heartfelt story. Um, and luckily for me, there was two emotional ladies doing the course with me. They both cried, so I ticked the other box as well. So, you know, my speaking career was off to a flying start. Well, that's what I thought anyway, and I thought this is a lot easier than milking cows, so maybe there's something in this. So that was great. But while I was giving that seven-minute talk, um, I'd, as I said, I'd already read the agenda, and the agenda, I'd read it, and while I was standing there, the, what we were about to do after the morning tea break was rolling around in my head. Because one of the things, as I said, with my anxiety and depression that I deal with, my internal dialogue is pretty crap most of the time. And so I'm standing up there, and while I'm giving that seven-minute talk, I was going through what the next agenda item was. And that was fairly far-fetched for me. And as I said, this guy that's in these leery clothes with a mohawk is telling me a bloke from the country, a dairy farmer, that you need to come up with a superhero name. I thought, you know, this is getting far-fetched and maybe I should have turned around at Seymour and went back home. Because I said, who, I was thinking to myself, who needs, a, who needs a superhero name? But while I was standing up doing this presentation, I'm trying to think of, ahead and think, well, what is my superhero name? And the only thing that I could come up with and the only thing that rolled around my head was Warren the Wanker. That's all I could come up with. I couldn't come up with anything else because that's what I felt like, to be honest with you, standing up in the front of that room that day. But luckily, as was going to get the um, a coffee at the morning tea break, uh, one of the guys come over to me. He goes, I know what your superhero name is. And I said, that's great because I said, this is what I reckon it is. He laughed. Um, but he said, no, 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 you're the unbreakable farmer. And I thought, that's pretty catchy. So instead of grabbing a coffee that day, I went to my computer, got on GoDaddy, um, searched the domain name, theunbreakablefarmer.com.au. It was available. I registered it. That's how I become the unbreakable farmer. My story's more about being broken than unbreakable. This course went for six, about six months. There was three face-to-face -face sessions and then weekly sessions online for that six months. I learned a lot. A lot of it was about marketing and building a brand and all that sort of stuff. And I'd all, I was out of that 20... Um, the group of 20 people. Um, I was probably the least credentialed to become a speaker, but I was the only person in that six in that six months to actually score a speaking gig, which was surprising to me. And then I got another one, another one. I was facilitating a mental health program in footy clubs as well. And you know, I was starting to share a little bit more about my mental health story. And I thought I'd better become a little bit more professional because everyone that has a business has got a logo. So my mate's a graphic designer, so I messaged him on Facebook one Wednesday night with an important gig coming up on the Friday and I said, I need a, I need a logo by Friday, mate. That intrigued him, that message. So he rang me straight away and he said, what do you need a logo for? You know, really inquisitively what he was asking. And I said, well, actually become a professional speaker. And he kind of said, bullshit, that's not true. And he's laughing his head off at the same time. So I'm pretty sure he thought I was pulling his leg. And he said, well, what would you be talking to anyone about? Like, typical mate, putting you down. He goes, and I said, look, I'm talking about my farming journey uh, around resilience, persistence and determination, my farming journey. And, um, uh, and he said, oh, that's fantastic, because he knew my farming journey. Uh, he knew the ups and downs that I'd been through, and he said, well, that's a, probably a great thing to share. And I said, but I'm also sharing a little bit about my mental health journey. And his joking nature went to dead silence. And it's, um, it was a real, I suppose, it's a key lesson for us all, is that my best mate never knew anything about my mental health journey. Um, I'd never discussed it with him. He probably never picked up on any of the signs and it was quite a shock to him. And once he gathered himself, he said, oh, maybe we'll talk about that at another day. And I said, yeah, we can. Um, then he had to obviously ask the inevitable question, he, what was my branding? And I'm sure my mate had Warren the Wanker rolling around in his head as well. And he probably already designed a logo all based around that because I'm sure he thought this was all a joke. 
And um, I said, no, I'm calling myself the unbreakable farmer. Well, that was enough to tip him over the edge. He just lost it. He ended up having to hang up because he was laughing that much. And he rang me back about five minutes later and he said, I'm sorry, that was a bit disrespectful, but, you know, you've caught me by surprise here. Um, he said, the unbreakable farmer, that sounds like a good name. Um, is there anything else I need to know? And I said, no, mate, that's it. That's about it. If you can knock something together for me, I'd be really appreciative. Anyway, 20 minutes later, he sent this logo that you can see on the screen back to me and um, I thought, well, he's a bit more clever than I thought he was to start off with. Never told him that because he'd get a big head, but um, he sent me this logo and it's something that I've stuck with, but he kind of missed the scope of works a little bit. Um, if you have a look at the unbreakable name, it's got two bits of wheat next to it. I was a dairy farmer, you're sure he could have put a couple of cows on there, but he put wheat instead. Um, I've managed, I've owned my own farm for 19 years, lost that and then managed five big operations, one in South Australia and four in the Goulburn Valley. None of them ever had a windmill on it, not one of those farms and he stuck a bloody windmill on me logo as well so he's kind of, he's not doing too well. But then the more I looked at it, the more I realised how clever he was by that 15 minute conversation, he nearly encapsulated everything I want to talk about in, in one logo. Um, if you have a look at the farmer, he looks like he's had a tough day. He looks like he's um, pondering either something's broken, it's either too wet, it's too dry, markets have dropped, you know, he's got to fix something tomorrow, he's got to spend money, he's got no money, whatever it is, he looks like he's just pondering his day. And the way he designed this logo, because it's a silhouette, um, you have a look at his trusty dog was always a couple of steps behind him, but in this, in this logo, the, the dog's black and everyone knows that the black dog is a symbol for mental illness. And that's when I realised, you know, my mate's pretty clever at what he does and it encapsulates everything that I want to talk about. And, and that's how The Unbreakable Farmer was born. No other way. My story is about being broken and unbreakable, but um, it was a catchy name. He made a good logo, so I've run with it ever since. Um, my story actually started in Melbourne. Mum and Dad were small business owners. Dad liked dibbling and dabbling a fair bit. We had milk bars, takeaway shops, post offices, taxi trucks, all those sorts of things. He was a butcher by trade, but he always harboured a dream of being a farmer. And we had friends that were farmers in Gippsland. We had a, a family member who was a dairy farmer in northern Victoria. We spent a lot of time on those farms. Um, at school growing up, I struggled. Not the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, particularly when it comes to, to maths or anything like that, which I don't know why it was so hard because you, know, you give me a cow ration now, I can knock it up in my head. I don't even need a computer and that's got a lot to do with maths. So I don't know why maths was so hard at school. Just didn't know why you had to have X's and Y's in everything when you know, it should have been numbers. And it was something that I never grasped till a lot later on in life or until I had a practical application for it. And so school I was struggling at and, and the other thing I was struggling at at school was particularly when I went to high school, I was subjected to a lot of bullying. And that bullying was, um, you know, I went to a Catholic boys' school in the suburb that I lived in, Melbourne, and that bullying started off as just verbal, just typical banter, but it was really affecting me. Ended up being quite um, ferocious, quite violent, every day getting the suitcase punched out of me every day at school. And that had a massive impact on my mental health and wellbeing, but also on my, on my education. So by the time I left that school with eight weeks of the school year to go, in year nine, I was failing school. And when I say failing school, if I ever brought home an E on my report, mum and dad would take me to Macca's and buy me a Happy Meal. Like that's, I was actually failing school really well. It was about that time that Dad decided that he wanted to um, enact his dream of being a farmer and we moved to the Goulburn Valley. For me, that was the great, the great turning point in my life because I thought at that stage I'd be able to leave everything behind in Melbourne. I hadn't deal with it, um, but just leave it behind. And, and you'll understand it as I unfold my story that there's an underlying theme is I didn't do enough about stuff when I should have. Um, and I could go to the country and invent, reinvent myself, and it, and it was. It was a reinvention. It was fantastic. You know, I loved farming. You know, as I said, we had friends who were farmers. 
they would, um, we used to spend a lot of weekends on either my mum's uncle's farm or down at our friends in Gippsland. And farming to me at that stage was all about tractors, motorbikes and slug guns. That's what I thought farming was, nothing else. And so moving to the country and having a farm, I just thought straight away, motorbike, tractor, slug gun, I'm in heaven, this will be great. Some of the things that kids just don't understand in the city, that these, there's these freedoms and that first day going to school, that, that first day at Kyabram High School, I had that freedom. I drove five k's down our road in an old paddock bomb, parked it under a willow tree and jumped on a school bus. Well, I'd never done that in my life. My only other way of getting to school was in Melbourne was on my 12-speed racer down the Burwood Highway, weaving in and out of traffic with my fingers crossed that I didn't get run over and killed and I'd make it to school alive or if I hadn't done my homework, hoping a bus had run me over and I didn't make it. But it was that was, now I'm driving a car down a road and I'm thinking, this is great. I'm 15 years old and thinking, you know, I am in heaven, I'm sure. Jumped on that school bus that first day, there was 30 kids, all wanted to know who I was, where I was from, and did I want to kick the footy at lunchtime once again. Something had never happened at my previous school, so this was a great turning point. The thing is, is I had this all new sense of confidence and I had eight weeks of that school year to pass year nine. I thought if I stuck my head down my bum up, I'd be able to do that. I thought I was smart enough to do that. Sat down in that first class at, at um, Kyabram High School, looked across the class and it was like someone punched me in the head. What do you reckon happened that day, that first day at Kyabram High School? Anyone want to have a guess? Hey, who said girls? Yeah, it was. It was girls. I'd been at a Catholic boys' school for three years. And I'd ne like in girls, sorry to be disrespectful, but girls change a little bit from grade six to year nine. And this, there was this blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl in every class that I sat in, and she used to sit opposite me in every class. Well, the bottom line is I failed year nine. Um, that eight weeks of that school year was a complete blur. I had no idea what was going on. Anyway, they put me up to year 10, but it wasn't too long into that year. I had to, as a 16-year-old, um, choose a career path, and that was farming. Chose farming as a career path. Luckily for me, I got a job and I could leave school straight away. So as soon as I got the job, I left school, started working on this farm. Once again, anxiety was playing a big part in my life that day, that first day. Um, you know, it was a, you know, out of control. I was also armed with two pieces of advice from our friends who were farmers. If I wanted to be a good farmhand, I had to do two things, show initiative and always look busy. So I had those two little gems of wisdom rolling around in my head as well. And while I was waiting for my boss to come back from breakfast after we'd milked the cows, I'd done a couple of odd jobs just around the shed cleaning up, um, he, he was obviously delayed and I'm starting to panic, I'm thinking, I've run out of jobs to do. I don't, I'm only just started here. What will I do? And I thought, well, I've seen this before, so I'll chip thistles. That's a good job. Everyone loves someone who chips thistles. So I, I grabbed a shovel and sharpened it on the bench grinder in the shed, um, went into this paddock in the front and thought, I'll start chipping thistles. He's going to see me. He's going to think he's hit the jackpot. Um, what, a, what a great worker I've got. Anyway, I walked down to the front of the paddock and there was these whopping big thistles and I thought I'll chip those ones off first. But unfortunately for me, when I cut the first thistle down directly under, that was a two-inch water delivery line to the farm and I sliced straight through it. Now, as a kid from Melbourne, opposed to me now, I know all I had to do is now I, all I, I know I have to walk into a shed, flick a switch and turn the pump off, but I didn't know that at that stage. So as my boss drove past, I was actually laying on a fountain of water trying to stop it coming up out of the ground. Um, and he just looked out of his ute and just shook his head as if to say, what the hell have I got myself into here? But he did promise me that he would teach me everything I needed to know about farming. And that day I learnt to be a plumber. I learnt to fence, pull tractors apart, put them back together, you know, fix cows, grow grass, you know, all that stuff that eventually become, you know, the bigger passion of farming that I had. So at 22, I was fairly cocky um, 
and life was being really kind to me because like I, I moved to a country town, I loved footy and I was playing senior footy at 16. Met a group of friends, as I said, had me tracked on me motorbike, me slug gun. I was happy, um, actually upgraded to a, to a shotgun, so that was even better, make a bigger hole in things. But um, I had all these things going for me and I met a girl. Um, she's still my wife, so I must have been okay because she's held on to me for this long. And, um, you know, life was really great. And at 22, I thought I knew everything about farming as well, so I went... I decided to leave that job and go out on my own and bought 200 acres next door to mum and dad's farm and naively as that 22 year old went into business with mum and dad. Now anyone that's been in a family business knows that that can be fraught with danger. Went into business with the bank because they lent me the money but also went into business with my silent business partner and her name's Mother Nature. She was the one that was going to throw me a couple of curveballs along the way. Now, as I said at the start, it doesn't matter how big or small your challenge is, and also my story is not unique. So a lot of people have been through some of these things that I'm going to talk about now. The first one, when Mother Nature came, was a flood. Now, one of the things I why I keep reiterating, you know, it doesn't matter how big or small or it's not unique, is because I get a bit of imposter syndrome when I talk about these things because I talk about my flood story um, in all my presentations and, you know, as you can see, it's a pretty pissy flood. Um, when I'm talking to a group of vegetable growers last year in the Brisbane Convention Centre and 100 people in the room are from the Lockyer Valley and they're, get, they're talking about getting rescued off the roof of their house in a helicopter and I'm walking around in ankle deep water. But the thing is, is if anyone's experienced a flood like this, we were actually underwater for a month, even though it was only that deep. And once it receded, there was just nothing but yuck and smell and clean up. And that's all there was. Now, this flood taught me some really good things. It taught me a lot about resilience, persistence, determination. It taught me how to deal with and adapt to changing conditions. You know, we were milking 300 cows off a of bitumen road for three and a half weeks. So that's fairly well adapting to your conditions. Um, and, and then obviously the recovery from this was fairly slow because we had to resow our whole farm, which, was a good, with, which in the end of the day was a good thing because we ended up with some fantastic pasture out of it. But what this did trigger um, in me was all that stuff that had happened to me as a kid that I hadn't dealt with was all in my face. The stress of this um, event triggered what I now call my mental health journey, which basically the best way I can describe it was a, was a cloud above my head. One of the things I realised now is I was the number one asset on that farm and I'm not blowing wind up my own in my own tyres here, but I was good at what I did. <clears throat> um, but part of my plan never involved looking after my own wellbeing. It was all about recovery. It was all about getting the ball rolling again, getting back into business. There was nothing in my recovery plan about, <clears throat> well, shit, you better look after yourself. And that was the way I rolled forward. We recovered from this, this um, flood and, you know, got back into business and everything was going great. But then, um, well, that jumped forward a bit. <coughs> um, my um, vision of the farm and mum and dad's vision of the farm went in two different directions and we ended up having a family um, breakdown on the farm where <coughs> our relationship com completely fell apart. I can remember one conversation I had with my mum um, one day and all that involved was a coffee cup whizzing past me right here and that was the only thing that happened that day and she was just, you know, and I was, you know, I was feeling pretty bad about that because family's my number one value um, but I was also fairly, you know, adamant that I was heading in the right direction and, and it just kept com completely falling apart. I had to find a solution to this, being one, a bloke and a farmer. I was tarred with the brush twice, so I had to come up with a solution. I did. I bought mum and dad out of the farm. Now, along with that, um, that solved the, the relationship issue because they moved into town. But I took on a fair bit of debt. Well, when I say a fair bit of debt, it was a million dollars, as, as well as the debt I already had. And, um, you know, as, uh, as I said yesterday, I, I've, I've told that story to a group of cotton growers in Chinchilla one day and they all just went, a million dollars, wow. 
you know, that's nothing. And actually it was in a room similar to this and I looked outside those sliding doors and it looked like Toyota had just done an airdrop of all the brand new Land Cruisers in the, in the whole of Australia. We dropped down the driveway of this, this farm that I was on and, um, you know, a million dollars was probably rattling around in each one of those ashtrays of those Land Cruisers. So, but as I said, it doesn't matter how big or small your challenge is, it's how it affects you. And this affected me in a big way. Added a lot of stress, but I also had developed a 10-year plan to move forward. Um, me and my wife, I was married by this stage. We had a couple of young kids, and so I was pretty adamant I was moving forward. We built this plan. It was pretty robust. It had lots of factors built into it, but wasn't really expecting what come next. And that was Mother Nature again, and she sent a drought. Now, this drought, um, or our plan, had drought built into it. Um, for the first couple of years of the drought, we were still flying along, you know, we'd built a new dairy, um, we'd bought more land, we'd built our herd size, but as it moved into the third and then the fourth year of the drought, things were starting to fall apart because we're irrigation farmers and we had no water. Um, we had a 20% allocation that year and we were used to basing our business on 200% um, at those, at, back in those days, so it was a massive... Um, turnaround. This picture that you can see on the screen was taken in July um, and I'd hand fed those cows for 12 months to get them to that stage. Then they started falling over, started dying and doing all those things that cows do in the drought because I was struggling to be able to afford feed for them. And now my job as a farmer was one, to look after them cows. That should be the other way when you hear the three, but I, this is the way I viewed my job as a farmer. Look after the cows, look after the farm. I can look after my family if I do those two jobs properly. Family should have been first, but it wasn't at that stage. I was so focused in what I was doing. But as this fell apart, I fell apart worse um, than I was ever before. Because when that family bust up, um, you know, from that family bust up onwards, that cloud that had started in the flood had turned into a spiral and by the time I got to the fourth year of the drought, I was spiralling out of control. I had no tools in my toolbox to be able to grab onto the edge of that spiral and I was out of control. And I got to a stage where what I call um, my two feet of perspective moment where everything was going wrong and I felt like I'd be better off not being here. I know it's a shit place to be. It's one of the things that really drives what I do today um, is understanding how scary, dark this place is um, when you feel that your only option is not to be here anymore. And, you know, I found myself that afternoon on the floor of my dairy thinking, what the hell's happened here? Um, life had given me two choices. It was either I continue to be bitter and twisted and blaming everything going on or I could choose to get better. And I chose that afternoon, luckily for me, to be, be able to make that decision to get better. And I tried, show, showed true resilience that, that afternoon. I picked myself up off the floor and dusted myself off and I went home, like I'd done during the drought, during the flood, during the family bust-up. Now, when I talk about resilience and, and dusting yourself off, you know, one of the things I said yesterday, I did this in a, in, a, um, in a room not long ago and there was five banners behind me and every one of them had the word resilience on it and I'm, here I am starting to bag resilience. But it's really good to be resilient, um, you know, to withstand and recover quickly from difficulties. But the way I look at resilience is a bit different. Resilience for me is not so much a character trait as an action that's born out of lack of alternatives. And that's where I found myself in my journey is, you know, you know hit by the flood. Um, what other option did I have than to pick myself up, dust myself off and, or dust the mud off at that stage, but move, move forward. Same family bust up. It was either stop farming or keep going. And so I really didn't have an alternative. It was more about just keep moving forward. But the problem with resilience is if you're not looking after yourself while you're dusting yourself off, it can all fall apart. And that's where I found myself falling apart. Um, and so it's really important that you look after yourself. To add insult to injury, about two months after this um, 
you know, my two feet of perspective moment, we actually lost our farm. We didn't actually lose it, we walked off our farm. We couldn't farm anymore. We were emotionally, physically and financially exhausted. Um, and I'd been offered a job in South Australia. So we locked the farm up, sold our cows, um, reduced our debt as much as we could and we moved to South Australia to manage a farm down there. We ended up selling our farm about two and a half years later. Um, but as we left the farm that day, as the furniture van pulled out of the, out of the driveway, I symbolically, as I lo locked the gate behind the truck, unclipped my identity and I hooked it on the front gate of my farm and left it with my farm because my identity was my farm. It was who I thought I was. Apart from all the other things in my life, I thought I was the farmer and I thought I'd, I'd failed and life was basically done. Um, didn't hold any, you know, really hold much value to the job that I was going to or anything like that. Um, and I thought, you know, I'd failed and that was it. And that's one of the biggest challenges that I've I had to overcome over the years. And over the years, I've learned a lot about my own journey and about the journeys of the people like, like yourself that I get the privilege to meet across Australia. And I've got some strategies and, and some stuff that I just want to share with you before I finish. Um, and it's about understanding a bit about mental health, about understanding when people are struggling and how you can help them. And that's where I'm going to start because we're human and we always want to help someone else first. So how can you help someone? And it's, this is a very simple strategy. Mental illness um, is a very complex issue. This strategy won't work in every situation, but it's a good starting point. So opening up a conversation, listening and supporting and encouraging people to get help is a great strategy to just... Um, to get that ball rolling. As I said, um, it's not going to help everyone and the unfortunate part of the space that I work in is it doesn't matter how, how hard you work or how hard you try, you're not going to save everyone and that's an unfortunate part of, of the, the work that I do. But opening up those conversations, we need to have, be empathetic and walk their path even though your path might be a lot different. Um, in our toolbox, one of the most important things we need is open-ended questions. And by that, I mean questions that are going to get more than a yes or a no answer. And not being disrespectful to any mental health um, initiative in Australia, because anything about awareness is good. But if I went and asked each and every one of you, are you OK? What are you going to tell me? Oh, I didn't pick on anyone yesterday, but what's your name, mate? Again, sorry, you said it before. David? You just gave me the answer that 99% of everybody in every room gives. Do you know what your answer was? Yeah, you didn't say anything. You just nodded your head and you went like that. It's like driving past your neighbour in a ute. You, automatic. Your finger just goes up. Like it's, you just, unless you hate him, and then the other finger goes up. But no, it's a whole different story. Um, but it's just an automatic reaction. So most people just go, yep, I'm all right. But, you know, if you've noticed that, that someone's really, you know, doing things out of ordinary, and, and one of those things could be just say something as insignificant as today, that your neighbour, you'd been talking to him last week or her last week, and she said, or they said they were coming today, and they're not here. Well, why aren't they here? There could be a thousand reasons why they're not here, but maybe one is that they, you know, have had a crap day or they're going for a crap time. So having some open-ended questions just that won't get a yes or a no or a nod of the head but leads to more conversations, a really important tool to have in your toolbox. You need to give them a, your undivided attention, remain non-judgmental. And one of the things that stops these conversations from happening in the first place is that we all get a bit scared because if I ask them and they say no, what am I going to say then? Oh, I've got to have answers and advice and I'm not a mental health expert. But the bottom line is you don't know, generally don't have to say anything. All you've got to do is listen and support. Um, listen quietly, demonstrate some genuine care and just be there for the person. Sitting there, you know, I get this romantic picture in my head every time I say this and that's just sitting on the back of a ute with your mate just chatting you know, and letting them tell their story or what's on their mind. Um, that's as simple, simple as that. That's sometimes all you have to do. Demonstrate genuine care. And even if you've known that person most of your life or all of your life, you might have to build some rapport and some trust for them to completely open up to you. 
Once you get that conversation going, we need to make sure that we are encouraging them to seek help. And, and that doesn't just generally mean go to the doctors, but there's resources and, and support networks that you can reach out to. But obviously, going to your GP or a psychologist is one of those steps. Um, but if you're truly concerned about someone's well-being and you think it's life-threatening, there's obviously the emergency services as well. The other thing that we've got to remember about opening up these conversations is, is that we just don't leave it there. We've got to continually check in on that person, particularly if you've encouraged them to seek help. Make sure you check in with them and make sure that they've followed up on seeking that help because that's real, a really important step. But just checking in and making sure that they know that you're in their corner is important. Then we obviously got to look after ourselves because that's, you know, we can't help others if we're not looking after ourselves. And there's three A's to self-help. First one is awareness. Now, the first point under awareness is particularly pointed at, at us blokes in the room because we're not real good at this, um, is having emotional understanding. Have some tools in your toolbox that um, helps you understand, control or have strategies in to be able to deal with your emotions and understand the behaviours that are attached to those emotions. Um, know what your values in life are. I know when I was in the middle of the drought, I stepped away from some of the values that, that I hold really closely just because of the stress of the situation. So have them firmly in your head as well. Um, check in with yourself and with others. Now, that's an um, important exercise, um, checking in with yourself. And, and for those that are sitting on a seat, I had a couple in the car that I didn't know I had yesterday, but this bit of paper, if there's one in front of you, grab it. It's what I call my unbreakable wheel of wellbeing. Now, it's not my work. You can Google anything on wellbeing domains. You'll get every fancy picture that you want. But this is something that I thought resonated with me. So this exercise entails um, checking in on yourself by going through all your wellbeing domains that you can see there, um, whether it's your physical, your mental health, um, your emotional health, yourself, intellectual, vocational, relationships, finances, whatever it is, whatever affects your wellbeing can create a spoke in your wheel. And the idea of the exercise is rate yourself one to five on each one of those domains and start drawing spokes in your wheel. So we're all here today, so we'll say socially we're all five. Five is excellent, one is terrible. So we'll, all, we'll start off on our social spoke. It'll go from the hub to the rim because we're a five. We've rated ourselves five. But if financially you're struggling a little bit, you might be only a three, so your spoke would go there. You can keep repeating that, um, that process through all your wellbeing domains until you've completely um, done all of them and you've completed your wheel. And then you have a look at it and you think, well, how balanced is my wheel? And everyone knows if you've got short and long spokes on your wheel, what happens to your wheel? Starts to wobble, completely starts to shake and then it'll eventually fall off. So the idea of this exercise is to give yourself a visualisation of what your wheel looks like and what areas of your life you need to work on. This was made very important. This exercise was become very important to me after I spoke to the, um, a group of prisoners in the Remand Centre in Melbourne. And one of the prisoners come up to me afterwards. Now, to give you an idea of this prisoner, um, he was about six foot tall. He was a mean looking hoor. He had tats everywhere. And they'd already explained to me that he probably wouldn't come to my session. He had four and a half months left of his sentence and he'd been inside for 20 years. So never asked him what he did, but it was obviously something good. And he come into the session about 10 minutes into my session and sat in a small room that was probably only up to the first couple of rows there. Um, and he sat dead centre with his arms folded and his head on an angle with this kind of death stare at me for my whole presentation. Always wondered why he was sitting there because he didn't look like he was listening. At the end of it, he stood up and instead of going out of the room, he walked towards me through the chairs, kicking him out of the way. 
and I was starting to panic a little bit because I looked next to me, had two warders that were or looked similar to this bloke here. He was a stick man. He was not going to save me. He was just like they were just standing there pretending to be tough, but this bloke would have snapped them both in half, at, both together at the same time. Anyway, he come and he rested his elbows right here. Very intimidating. And he goes to me, that wheel of well-being you just spoke about. And I said, yes, mate. He said, intellectually, I'm a five. I said, mate, I'm not arguing with anything that you say. You can be anything. You can be ten if you want. And he goes, also, physically, I'm also a five. And I said, well, mate, you are, because this guy had the biggest arms I'd ever seen. For 20 years, all he's done is pump weights. But he goes, intellectually and emotionally, I'm not even a one. He said, and when I visualise my wheel, it's actually a triangle and I'm stuck. And he said, all I want to do in four and a half months is roll out that door and never come back again. And he said, this has really been uh, enlightening for me. And he said, so I'm going to put my weights down and I'm not going to do any weights for the next couple of months. And hopefully in four and a half months, even though my wheel might be a bit wobbly and a bit lumpy, I'm going to roll out that door and never come back again. And even though that's not a farming story, that really had an impact on me and it made me realise how this simple exercise could be really important in your life. So that exercise, I do that once a fortnight just to get a visualisation of what areas I need to work on. And to be honest with you, when I do it each, way, every, each fortnight, it changes. So simple exercise that you can take away and, and maybe try for yourself. The second A is acknowledgement. One thing that I really want you to know um, or do today or take away from today is understand who the five people in your life are that are in your support network. Who are the five people if the proverbial hits the fan you can turn to and have a conversation with? Now, it's another exercise that you can do and these exercises are actually really good to do when things are going good, not when things are going bad, when things are going good. So you can build up some tools in your toolbox so when things get tough, you've got tools to rely on. And those five people in your life are the ones that, you know, you can have tough, you know, really heartfelt, tough conversations with. Now, the exercise entails identifying or acknowledging who they are, then having a conversation with them around, you know, I'm building a support network around myself. I've identified yours as part of my support network and if I can return the favour, I'll be part of yours. It's a really great conversation to have, actually, because then you realise who you need in your support network and you know that you can also support others. The thing, an interesting part of my, when I sat down to do this exercise is that I'm lucky I've got five kids. I've got a 30-year-old who's nearly an adult. I've got a 13-year-old daughter, a 19-year-old daughter that's been an adult for 13 and a half years. So I've got five adult kids. I've got a wife. I've got a psychologist. I've got a doctor. I've got a mentor that I've only ever met once, but I talk to on a quite constant basis. So there's I've, I've got you know a good couple of handfuls already. The interesting part that when I sat down and did this exercise, my two best mates aren't part of my network aren't part of my support network. Even though they'd be there for me to have a beer and put their arm around me, they haven't actually got the tools in their toolbox to be able to support me if, you know, shit really hit the fan. So it's, um, so it's an interesting exercise to do and I really identified out of my, in my support network the most important parts of my support network are my dogs. We can go for a walk every night. I can tell them everything that's on my chest and they... Um, you know, they don't judge me, they still love me and all they want is to swim in the channel. So, but I feel better for, from that. So know who is in your support network, your triggers, your positive, your, your negative triggers, your stresses and your challenges and try and build into your daily routine a, a non-negotiable, just something that you do for yourself. It's really hard in rural communities but particularly with farmers to, to, have, to try and sell this concept of do something for yourself every day. But even if that means just sitting in the ute for 10 minutes and just decompressing, listening to a song, you know, looking at, you know, across the paddock, whatever it is, just, you know, do something um, for yourself every day that just um, is something for your own mental health and wellbeing. Third A is action. Control what you've got control over. If you can control it and you've got the power, 
that's all good and well. If you need to control it and you can't control it, that's when you need to stick your hand up and ask for help. Um, you know, and this goes for any part of your life, whether it's your mental health, your physical health, your business, your finances. Have gratitude, your who, what and your why, and build some mindfulness strategies into your toolbox as well. Mine's taking sunrise and sunset photos. It just helps me live in the moment and focus on those small things in life. I want to leave you with my three greatest failures, but my three greatest lessons. Um, the first one is communication is key. It's so vitally important um, that we communicate with each other, how we're travelling, how we're feeling. Make sure that the people around us, particularly our support network, know how we're feeling. Because, you know, there's nothing worse when you go into a community after there's been um, a death by suicide in that community and people go, oh, we didn't know or we didn't ask or whatever. We just need to communicate, OK? Why it's my number one is that, that two feet of perspective moment. I never shared what happened that afternoon with my wife for three and a half years. And it was a massive burden to carry. Um, so make sure you communicate. Second lesson, stay connected. When I hit rock bottom, I stopped doing all the things I loved. Isolated myself from my community, which just only exacerbated my spiral downwards. Isolation is the biggest killer in our community, so we've got to stay connected. And it doesn't matter what your community looks like to you, whether it's family, friends, whether it's your work colleagues, your sporting the people in your sports club, or whether it's a community group like this. Stay connected, keep communicating. And the most powerful thing in any community is shared wisdom. And by that I mean each and every one of us in this room has travelled a journey and we've all picked up pieces of wisdom along our way. And we seem to, a lot of the time, hold our wisdom close to us. But by, by staying connected and communicating with those people around us, we can share some of that wisdom. And you never know, that piece of wisdom that you're holding really tight in your hand could be the piece of wisdom that the person sitting next to you has been searching for all their life. So make sure we communicate, stay connected, and then obviously if you are struggling or you know someone that's struggling, make sure you seek help. Make sure you reach out to the plenty of... There's support networks all around us that we can reach out for help, but make sure that you're reaching out and getting the support that you need. Um, it's vitally important. Um, cut a bit of an advert for me. I've got a podcast that you can, um, that you can download and listen to. And by my, one of the reasons that I set this podcast up was... Um, to share the stories of the interesting people I've met along my journey. Um, and as you'll find if you do listen to any of the episodes, my story's not unique. And each and every one of these people have had some sort of challenge in their life um, that, you know, that, they've, that I've felt needed to be articulated to the rest of the world. So you can do that. You can um, listen to my podcast or subscribe to my newsletter where I put out some stuff that you know, might be of interest to you or your community. But one of the things, as I said, talk about your who, what and your why and, and gratitude. One of the things I'm really grateful for is that if a group of people want to listen to a washed up dairy farmer, speak for a, a, for a little bit of any sort of time, I'm always grateful for that. But what would make me truly grateful is if um, you've resonated with any part of my story and you can use that, any part of what you've heard today, whether it's just resonating with my story or a tip or a strategy that you can use um, to help yourself or help someone that you love, that, that would make me truly grateful. But thanks for having me. Hannah, thanks for the invitation to come and speak over the last two days. And, um, yeah, thanks for your um, attention and patience. Um, Cheers. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks, Warren. And, uh, yeah, thank you for your time for yesterday and, and today. Um, yeah, some really good tips in there. I'd probably really encourage people to jump on to Warren's um, podcast and have a listen. He actually told me yesterday he's got Wally Lewis recording next Monday, which would be a really interesting story, I think. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Warren. Well, that brings us to the end of our day. Uh, a couple things. Just wanted to, again, thank Warren and Jody had to fly. They have got shearing on tomorrow, so um, she had to take off, and I did thank her for her time. Thanks to all our other speakers. Um, 
great work, Hannah, who did all the heavy lifting and getting this organised, and um, she's done a fantastic job. And she's had a little team of helpers yesterday and today, just uh, you know, getting the stands uh, set up and doing those final touches and thanking them for their efforts. Uh, Southern New South Wales Innovation Hub, thanks for their support and getting this on the ground. Um, the trade stalls out the back, um, those guys, thank you for your support. Um, the AV at the back, they've done a, a fantastic job yesterday and today. And uh, the Binya community um, putting on a great lunch and morning and afternoon tea, it's been fantastic. So anyway, uh, and thank you guys for turning up and listening in and hope you got something out of today. And um, safe travels home, and that's us. Thanks. Wow.